Welcome to this second session in our inquiry series. Today, we're going to look at the Bible. What is its history? What does it contain? And how should we use and read it? I hope that you will find this informative and interesting and that it will be a good start to your biblical studies. So how did we get the Bible that we have today? It actually started a very long time ago. The books of the Hebrew Old Testament were written between 1400 and 400 BC. In 250 to 200 BC, the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Old Testament, was produced. This will be mentioned again further on. In AD 45 to 85, approximately, the Greek New Testament books were written. Now we come to a little bit later, 90 to 118, and the councils of Jemina. <clears throat> Jemina was an ancient city located near the coast of Palestine, south of Jaffa. It was a small town near the coast, about 15 miles south of the modern Tel Aviv, and about 25 miles east of Jerusalem. It is thought by some that this late first century meeting was held in Jemina and closed the Old Testament canon circa AD 90. It may also have been the occasion when the Jewish authorities decided to exclude believers in Jesus as the Messiah from the synagogue, as referenced by John chapter 9, verse 22. A little bit later than this, 140 to 150 in Rome, around the year of 144, a man by the name of Marcion espoused belief that Jesus was the Saviour sent by God, and Paul the Apostle was his chief apostle but he rejected the Hebrew Bible and the God of Israel. He created a heretical New Testament, and this motivated Orthodox Christians to form a New Testament canon. Then came Diocletian's persecution, and he confiscated and destroyed many of the New Testament scriptures. In 325 was the Council of Nicaea, and here was the development of the biblical canon it was nearly complete at this stage in the form that we know it. In 367, Athanasius wrote a festal letter, and in it he lists the complete New Testament canon of 27 books for the first time, so that we know that it is formed and set by 367, which is actually quite a lot later than a lot of people think. The festal letters, or Easter letters, are a series of annual letters sent by the bishops of Alexandria that announced the date on which Easter was to be celebrated, in conformity with the decision of the First Council of Nicaea. Of the 45 festal letters of Athanasius, the 39th, written for Easter of AD 367, is of course of particular interest as regards this canon of scripture. The timeline continues for us here in the West, because in 400, Jerome translated the Bible into Latin, the Vulgate version, which I'm sure you've heard of. And then it was translated into English from Latin quite early on, I think, con you know, considering a lot of people don't think it was translated into English this early. Uh, Cademan, a monk, put the Bible into verse in English. Then we have in 735, the Venerable Bede translating the Gospels. And 871 to 899, King Alfred the Great, the one who burnt the cakes, translated the Psalms and the Ten Commandments. Then in 950, the seventh century Lindisfarne Gospels received an English translation. For well, most of you, have heard of Qumran and the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Here is a video by Father Mitch Pakwa talking about just this subject. A few things more about the background of this community. When and why did the Qumran community get started? You have to go back to the time of the Maccabees. The Maccabees were a group that fought against 
the Greek king that was very oppressive. But already the Jews were divided among themselves. The Sadducees were one party of Jews composed of the priests and the nobles and they wanted to go along with the Greeks. The Pharisees were a group that were against the Greeks and they were mostly composed of the laity and they wanted the law to be strictly lived while the Sadducees wanted to adapt to the Greek culture. So they did a number of things like the, the first book of Maccabees mentions that they wore Greek style hats instead of turbans like a Jew. And they, they wore Greek style clothes and they had a gymnasium like the Greeks did. And the gymnasium comes from the Greek word gymnos, which means that you're naked. So they would do their athletics with no clothes on. So Jews found that very offensive. So these were some of the tensions that existed among them. And the, um, uh, but eventually the Maccabees won in a guerrilla war against the Greeks. The, the Maccabees then became the leaders and they began to form their own kingdom, their own, their own uh, commonwealth. And there wasn't a kingdom yet until 142 BC when the last of the Maccabee brothers declared himself to be both the high priest and the king. Some of the other priests said, you can't be both. Either be the high priest or be the king, but you can't do both. And he said, oh yes, I can. And so they said, well, you can't. They said, the can't went back and forth. So finally they said, he said to them, you have to leave Jerusalem. I'll kick you out of the priesthood. Said, you can't kick us out. We're leaving. This this became the mentality. Okay, and so the a group of priests who would not tolerate Jonathan being priest and king came down here to Qumran. This tower already existed. It was built by the kings of Israel, probably in the 700s. Uh, BC and it was a ruin. They came here and they started to build a community uh, center around this tower. And they had a leader that they called the teacher of righteousness. They taught, as you heard in the movie, a lot about the end of the world, that they were going to be part of the people who were victorious against evil. In fact, they were going to be the only ones who were victorious against evil. And they opposed everybody else, everybody else. So this uh, uh, is you know, the, the basis for the community. And what they would do is copy scripture and they would write commentaries on the Bible explaining their own ideology and what it is that they believe. So that was one of the things that they did. And then um, they stayed here until there was an earthquake. I forget the year of the earthquake. But there was an earthquake, the community was abandoned for a while, but then they came back. And they stayed here until 68 AD. In 68 AD, the Roman army came from Galilee toward Jerusalem. They came here and they wiped out the community. But before the community was wiped out, they had hidden all of their scrolls in the caves around here. Again, in 11 caves that have been discovered, they hid their scrolls. And so now we have them. These are presently the oldest copies of the Old Testament that we have, by far. The next oldest copy of the Old Testament in Hebrew goes back only to 925 AD. So these are a thousand years older than the next oldest copy of the Bible. So you can see how they became extremely important 
for being able to test the authenticity of the biblical text. In my Hebrew Bible, I have on the bottom of the page any variation between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, the, the one from 925. There are very few spelling differences. You can, when you look at them, you know, again, you've got to know Hebrew, but uh, when you look at it, you can see why some of the mistakes might have been made because they sounded just like the other one, but it was a slight difference, or it looked like it. For instance, the R and the D easily get mixed up. And uh, the He and the He also get mixed up. And so there'll be a few few letters like that that are close to each other that get mixed up and they make a little mistake here and there. But other than that, the uh, text is extremely faithful. So it shows that the Jews were very, very careful about how they passed on copies of the Bible. Okay? Now, we already mentioned, they mentioned that John the Baptist may or may not have been part of this community. We cannot prove it. However, I myself tend to think that he was part of the community, partly because at the, in the last verse of Luke chapter 1, it mentions that John was raised in the wilderness. Secondly, he was the son of, a, of an elderly priest. And one of the things that the Qumran community did was raise the orphans of priests. You know, when priests uh, had kids uh, and the priest died, died, then the, they would raise them here until they were 18. And then they gave them the chance to stay in the community or to leave. Third, the verse that John the Baptist quotes more often than any other from the Old Testament is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 2. A voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Okay? That also happens to be the one verse of the Old Testament that is quoted more often than any other verse in the Dead Sea Scrolls. No other verse appears as often as that. So, you know, you've, you've got that kind of evidence. And finally, John was baptizing less than five miles away from here. So, uh, and they also baptized. Now, those are the similarities. One of, there are some significant differences between Qumran people and John. He would baptize sinners. They refused to have anything to do with sinners. They, they refused to have anything to do with uh, Pharisees, Sadducees, and any sinners at all. Whereas John would baptize the sinners. Now, there is a point where he's similar. The, the Qumran community considered the scribes and Pharisees to be vipers and snakes. They used the same language about the, the uh, scribes and Pharisees that John the Baptist used for them. Exactly the same vocabulary. So, so the, that's another similarity. But John would baptize the sinners. And this community would have nothing to do with them. And John saw himself preparing for the coming of the Messiah, while this community believed that it was the coming of the end of the world, and that only they were going to survive. So those are some of the connections and distinctions between the two. And, um, and I think that, those, that that gives a background of why John may well have been part of it, but left. He also was different from them. One last issue, was Jesus ever a member of the Essenes? There is no evidence that he was. You know, as a matter of fact, there is a line in the Sermon on the Mount where it says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your friends, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. That is a quote from the Dead Sea Scrolls. That is not from the Old Testament. So the Qumran community taught that you love your neighbor and hate your enemy. <laughs> but the 
Old Testament and the rabbis never taught that. So he's criticizing the, the teaching of the Qumran community. He knows it, but he doesn't agree with it. So he's probably not ever a part of this community. That's, very, that's much less likely than John the Baptist. So let's have a quick look at what we find in the Old Testament. The Pentateuch is a term referring to the first five books of the Old Testament. It comes from the Greek penta and tukos, implement or volume, meaning the first five volumes or implementation of five books. It may also be translated as five-fold scroll. In Judaism, it is called the Torah or teaching and the law of Moses. Genesis begins with primeval history, the story of creation and the Garden of Eden. The account of the descendants of Adam to the rise of Noah, who survives the great flood. And the account of the descendants of Noah to the Tower of Babel, where the languages of the world are confused when they try to build a tower that reaches heaven. And the rise of Abraham, who later becomes Abraham. <coughs> Then follows the story of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and the life of Joseph. God gives them a promise of the land of Canaan. But at the end of Genesis, Jacob's clan leaves Canaan for Egypt because of a famine. Exodus describes the rise of Moses, who ultimately led the Israelites out of Egypt into Mount Sinai, where he gave them God's covenant and laws and dealt with the violation of the law when Israel made the golden calf. He also mediated God's instructions for the building of the tabernacle. Now Leviticus begins with instructions about how to use the tabernacle that the Israelites have just built, and then follows a long enumeration of the rules of cleanliness, the day of atonement, and the holiness code, that is, various moral and ritual laws. So Leviticus is the book of, of laws and how to behave. Numbers describes two censuses in which the number of Israelites are counted and many laws are intermingled with the narratives. The narratives tell how Israel consolidated itself as a community at Sinai, how it set out from Sinai to move towards Canaan and spied out the land. Because of unbelief, especially at Kadesh Barnea, when they refused to take the promised land, the Israelites were condemned to wander for 40 further years in the desert in the vicinity of Kadesh, instead of immediately entering the land of promise. And Moses, because of this sinfulness and his own personal involvement in it, was told he would not live to enter the promised land. At the end of Numbers, Israel moves from the area of Kadesh towards the Promised Land. They leave the Sinai Desert. They defeat two Transjordan kings, Og, who was a great giant, and Sihon, and come to occupy a territory outside Canaan. At the end of the book, they are on the plains of Moab opposite Jericho, ready to enter the land. Deuteronomy is primarily a series of speeches by Moses on the plains of Moab opposite Jericho urging Israel to obey God and instructing them further on the laws. At the end of the book, Moses is allowed to see the promised land from the top of Mount Nebo, where he dies and is buried by God, before Israel begins the conquest of Canaan. The historical books of the Old Testament tell the history of the Israelites under the law of Moses, their transition from a nation led by God alone to a monarchy under kings, the first being Saul, followed by King David, and of course later, Queen Esther. It also tells the story of Israel's relationships with their neighbours and with God. Kingdoms 1-4 to tells this part of Jewish history, and the first two of the kingdom books are known in the West as 1 and 2 Samuel. Talmudic teaching holds that Samuel wrote them. The Maccabees were written in the later part of the 2nd century BC. Those books in green were left out of the Western Bible from the 1800s and are sometimes found in a supplement called the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha was always part of the Bible, but in 1881 or thereabouts, 
two Western scholars, Westcott and Hort, decided they should no longer be part of the Bible, and in the Protestant West this has remained the case. It is all to do with original sources used to translate the Bible, and is a discussion for another time. And so we continue. Wisdom literature is a genre of literature common in the ancient Near East. It comprises statements by sages that teach about divinity and virtue. Although this genre uses techniques of traditional oral storytelling, it was disseminated in written form. The term sapiential books or books of wisdom is used in biblical studies to refer to a subset of the books of the Hebrew Bible in the earliest extant Greek translation known as the Septuagint which I mentioned earlier. The Minor Prophets, or Twelve Prophets, occasionally called the Book of the Twelve, is the last book of the prophets, or literally spokespersons, in the second main division of the Hebrew Bible. The prophets are divided into two groups. The former prophets, consisting of the narrative books of Joshua, Judges, and Kingdoms 1-4, to while the latter prophets include the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve Minor Prophets. The terms Minor Prophets can also refer to the Twelve traditional authors of these works. The term Minor relates to the length of each book, ranging from a single chapter to 14. Even the longest is short compared to the three major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. It is not known when these short works were collected and transferred into a single scroll, but the first extra biblical evidence we have for the Twelve as a collection is circa 190 BC in the writings of Jesus ben Sirach. And evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls suggests that the modern order was established by 150 BC. It is believed that initially the first six were collected and later the second six were added. The two groups seem to complement each other with Hosea through to Micah raising the question of iniquity and sinfulness, and Nahum to Malachi proposing resolutions to this. Many, though not all, modern scholars agree that the Book of the Twelve reached its final form between 538 and 332 BC. The Book of Jonah is an anonymous work containing no prophetic oracles, which was probably composed in the Hellenistic period between 332 and 167 BC. In general, each book includes three types of material, autobiographical material in the first person, some of which may originate with the prophet in question, biographical materials about the prophet in the third person, which demonstrates that the collection and editing of the books was completed by writers other than the prophets themselves, Oracles or speeches by the prophets draw on a wide variety of genres, including covenant lawsuit, oracles against the nations, judgment oracles, messenger speeches, songs, hymns, narrative laments, law, proverb, symbolic gesture, prayer, wisdom saying, and vision. A whole gamut of things covered by these books. The arrangement found in current Bibles is roughly chronological. First come those prophets dated to the early Assyrian period, Hosea, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah and Micah. Joel is undated, but it was possibly placed before Amos because parts of a verse near the end of Joel and one near the beginning of Amos are identical. Also we can find in both Amos and Joel a description of a plague of locusts. These are followed by prophets that are set in the later Assyrian period, Nahum, Habakkuk and Zephaniah. Last come those set in the Persian period, Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. The Major Prophets is a grouping of books in the Christian Old Testament, but it does not occur as a group in the Hebrew Bible. These books are centred on individual prophets, traditionally regarded as the author of the respective book. The term major, as mentioned before with minor, refers only to their length. To tell us a bit more, 
Here is an excerpt from an interview from the Greek Orthodox Church in America on the subject of the Old Testament. Welcome to the television series entitled Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacey Spanos, your host for these programs, which are designed to explain the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. We're honored to be filming at the Holy Cross Chapel on the campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in beautiful Brookline, Massachusetts. And we know that you'll learn so much about our faith and traditions. So in today's program, we'll discuss the Bible in the Orthodox Church, specifically the Old Testament. Our guest on the program is Reverend Dr. Harry Pappas, pastor of Archangels Greek Orthodox Church in Stamford, Connecticut, and adjunct professor at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary in Yonkers, New York. Father Pappas is a specialist in the Old Testament, having earned his PhD in the subject. So thank you and welcome. It's good to be here. First of all, who wrote the Old Testament, Father Pappas? Traditionally, the Old Testament was written by the prophet and lawgiver Moses, the first five books, then by other figures as the prophet Isaiah, the uh, king and prophet King David, uh, Solomon, his successor, and many other of the prophetic figures and wisdom figures that are recorded in Scripture. We know on the basis of a lot of contemporary scholarship that while traditional authorship has been given, assigned to these very important figures, that oftentimes there are portions of the Old Testament that we are simply not aware who exactly wrote it, even if they were ascribed to these major figures like Moses and David and Isaiah. So how did it come into existence? It started through storytelling, the best that we can gather, maybe about 4,000 years ago about the time that the patriarch Abraham had been called by God out of what is now present-day Iraq and to travel to a land that he did not know. From then, the stories began about God's interaction with Abraham's family and lineage and the people that came from them, the people of ancient Israel, the people from whom Jesus Christ came. And from storytelling, there emerged uh, the re recording of events events like the call of Abraham, stories about the creation, the exodus in Egypt, the wilderness wanderings, the establishment in Cana where the promised land, and then uh, from royal decrees once God's people were set up with their own government, then um, sayings of prophets that were either written down during their lifetime or after that, as well as recording of wisdom figures like Solomon in books like the Proverbs. Do we know at what point it was bound into book format and disseminated to the masses? We don't have any reliable record with exactitude, but the best that we've been able to establish with the result of a lot of contemporary scholarship as well as ancient wisdom is that the first part and most significant part, traditionally, the Torah or the law, really came into being in the Babylonian exile about 580 years before Christ was born. Then there were other writings of prophets, recordings of the kings, chronicles, and wisdom literature that came about in ensuing, that were finalized in centuries that followed the Babylonian exile. Who are the most important figures in the Old Testament? Without a doubt, uh, the most important figures would be Adam and Eve, the first created human beings, uh, then Noah, uh, above all, Abraham as the first called of God's people and the father of all believers, uh, David, the first king of Israel, Moses, the prophet and lawgiver, and the prophet Isaiah. Those would be the greatest of the figures of the Old Testament. What are some of the most important events to come out of the Old Testament? Without a doubt, uh, the event of the exodus from Egypt is the event of the Old Testament. 
It is the time when God's people had been oppressed for hundreds of years in Egypt, and they were liberated by a God who finally heard their prayers of a cry out of this oppression to lead them through Moses, through many acts of deliverance to cross the Red Sea, to go through the wilderness wandering to inherit the promised land. After that, the most significant event would be the Babylonian exile when God's people, the southern kingdom of Judah, were taken into exile about 580 years before Christ was born because that was the greatest tragedy that ever happened. And from those events, uh, or rather I should say in between those events, the most significant thing would have been the establishment of King Chum and kingship with David because David as Messiah, which refers in the Old Testament not to a future figure, but to a reigning anointed king to govern his people in this world, in this life, from that time, from that establishment, uh, comes the dynamic of who is Messiah that will finally fulfill David and finally bring God's rule and reign in this life. What books do you believe are the most important when it comes to studying the Old Testament? Uh, in my estimation, the books of Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, the Psalms, and Isaiah would be the most important parts of the Old Testament for and us. Why? Uh, Genesis lays the foundations of creation, of what it means to be human, of the original state in which we're created, uh, how we corrupted and lost that great privilege, what God kept doing to restore and heal us to our promised inheritance, and how that works itself out through the call of Abraham and his, his uh, successors, his, his descendants, Isaac and Jacob and the people of Israel. Exodus, because it records the call of Moses, the deliverance of God's people from the Exodus and the beginning of the movement to promised land. Deuteronomy, because it's the summary of God's teachings and commandments that establishes how they are to live forever and includes many important uh, things that look towards taking possession of the promised land and living as a settled people. The book of Psalms, because that's the most quoted in the New Testament and it is the heart of Orthodox worship and is the book of prayer from which we learn how to pray. And Isaiah, because he's considered by the great fathers of the church to be the fifth evangelist, because from that book, more is gleaned and pertains to the life and especially the passion, death, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The New Testament seems to have a feeling of love and compassion. These are the teachings of Jesus. In the Old Testament, God seems vengeful and angry. Why is that? The Old Testament it records a far longer period of history than does the New and includes God's revelation at a particular time and place for a particular people. So therefore, it does not contain the fullness of all that God has to reveal, but while there are times where God does appear to be angry and vengeful and wrathful, there are many other portions of the Old Testament that are simply not known where God is extraordinarily loving and compassionate and forgiving. The Old Testament over a much longer period of time was written where people, the God's people, were in circumstances that involved warfare, conquest, dealing with hostile powers, dealing with foreign religious traditions that were alien and threatening to their own viability as the unique separated people of God. The New Testament, by contrast, deals with the fullness of revelation in Jesus, through Jesus, the Messiah or Christ, a much shorter period of time, and involves a time where God's people do not have control of society or an ability to defend themselves in, a, in some military fashion or to manifest their own desires when threatened through ways other than suffering and persecution. You just brought up, or you had brought up Genesis, and, and I wanted to ask you about an issue that some theologians bring up with Genesis, even some lay people, that there are two different creation stories. Explain what the differences are. Well, we, uh, people typically refer to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 as two different creation accounts. They both differ in terms of language and content and even thrust. However, the best way to understand them now is to see Genesis chapter 1 as setting the theological spiritual parameters and outline by which to understand the more specific story in Genesis chapter 2. 
So we learn different theological and spiritual lessons from each, understanding chapter two, not to be separate from chapter one, but rather a further refinement and detail of what chapter one provides on a larger scale. Well, explain to us the differences. Well, the differences include that God speaks and creates by a word alone in chapter one, whereas in chapter two, he's working with material, clay, to form human beings. In chapter one, there is a great deal of attention to the creation involving water, whereas in chapter two, there's a great attention to dry land. Uh, there are different, in chapter one, God is, creates human beings, male, female, instantaneously at the same time. Whereas in chapter two, God creates the man, Adam, first, then from him creates the woman, Eve. Some of the differences between the two. And so which one are we to digest, to believe? Both. <laughs> because chapter two gives us in from detailed information that chapter one simply doesn't provide. And because our ancient Hebrew ancestors who provided us these inspired stories were simply not as concerned as maybe we American Christians might be in having everything to be completely harmonized, they had no problem with distinct and different angles of the creation story, just like they had with different angles of the flood account or of the establishment of kingship later in the Bible, where you've got details that don't always fit together, but they're part of a wonderful, multifaceted story that has different angles to it that can all just be harmonized, squeezed into one nice, neat narrative. Moving on to the New Testament. The New Testament comprises 27 separate works. The four narratives of Jesus' ministry called the Gospels, a narrative of the Apostles' Ministries, which is also a sequel to the third Gospel written by Luke, 21 early letters commonly called epistles in biblical context, which were written by various authors and consist mostly of Christian counsel and instruction, and an apocalyptic pro prophecy, which is also technically the 22nd epistle. Each of the Gospels narrates the ministry of Christ, the traditional author is listed after each entry. Modern scholarship differs on precisely by whom, when, or in what original form the various Gospels were written. The Gospel of Matthew, traditionally written by the Apostle Matthew, the son of Alphaeus. The Gospel of Mark, traditionally written by the Apostle Mark, who wrote down the narrative given by the Apostle Peter. The Gospel of Luke, traditionally written by the Apostle of Luke, who wrote down the narrative given by the Apostle Paul, who was formerly called Saul, and the Gospel of John, traditionally by the Apostle John, the son of Zebedee. Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, also called the Book of Acts, or just Acts, is a narrative of the Apostles' ministry after Christ's death, and a sequel to the third Gospel. Holy tradition, as well as style, phraseology and other evidence, say that Acts and Luke have the same author, the Apostle Luke. Luke wrote down his narrative from the words of the Apostle Paul, with whom he travelled to Rome. We then have the Pauline epistles, and those constitute the epistles attributed to Paul, Through, though, though of course his authorship of some of them is disputed such as Hebrews, which is often attributed to Paul, though there was a debate even in the early church about its, its particular authorship. They consist mostly of moral counsel and behavioral instruction, though they do include other elements as well. Paul appears to have dictated the epistles to a scribe, and some specifically mention his habit of appending a salutation in his own handwriting. The general epistles, or Catholic epistles, are those written to the church at large, so Catholic in the sense of universal. The epistle of James was traditionally written by James the Just, first and second Peter, traditionally by the apostle Simon, called Peter, and first, second and third John, traditionally by the apostle John, son of Zebedee, and Jude, by the apostle Jude. Finally, we have 
the book of prophecy, the book of Revelation, or the Apocalypse of John, traditionally written by the Apostle John, the son of Zebedee. It is the only book of the New Testament which is not read during Orthodox Church services. And this is because of various reasons, but particularly because of its capacity for misinterpretation. After that whistle-stop tour of the New Testament, here is a little more information with another excerpt from an interview from the Greek Orthodox Church in America, this time on the subject of the New Testament. Today we'll discuss the Bible in the Orthodox Church, the New Testament. Our distinguished guests today are Reverend Dr. Eugene Pentiuk. He is professor of Old Testament and Hebrew at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. And Dr. Bruce Beck. He is assistant professor of New Testament and director of the Stephen and Catherine Pappas Patristic Institute at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Stacy. Father Eugene, let me begin with you. Take us back to the time of Jesus. What was it like for him? How was he received by the masses? First of all, we don't have to forget that Jesus came to his own people. And he said, I came to the lost sheep of Israel. All we have the tendency of looking at Jesus like an old own tradition, the Orthodox tradition, but we forget the first message of Jesus was addressed to the people of Israel. And Jesus knew about this, and also he wanted to embody the whole history of the people of Israel in his own persona. So God, the Creator, looking at him, seeing the new Israel reviving, coming back to his mission to become a light for Gentiles. Of course, the first Christianity that we know was the Jewish Christianity. And this is very well reflected in the gospel according to Matthew. We see Jesus in his Jewishness. He came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He came with a plan to become the light to other nations. Actually, the mandate that Jesus gave to the apostle was, go to the nations, ta etne, not going to the people of Israel, but go to the nations and be the light that Israel was supposed to be. Now, Paul came a little bit later, we know, and he came with this beautiful transition from Jesus, the new Israel, to what he calls Jesus, Eschatos Adam, the last version of humanity in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. He opened Jesus' mission to entire humanity. And then we have this type of theology, if you like, reflected in the gospel of his disciple, St. Luke. If you look at the both genealogies, Matthew and Luke, you observe this difference. In Matthew's genealogy, Jesus is called the son of Abraham, is Jewish. In the Gospel of Luke, he's called the son of Adam. So this transition from a Jewish Christianity to a kind of more gentilic Christianity was done by Paul and then fulfilled extremely well by John and his gospel. That's why we have three groups of Christianity, Jewish, Gentilic, and Johannine. And is basically that how the New Testament came to exist, Dr. Beck? Um, the New Testament uh, developed in, over stages. Um, initially, the, there was the oral um, stories that were um, passed on by the apostles uh, through the preaching of the earliest apostles. Um, but the books that we have now in the New Testament, they really came at the end of the apostles' lives, it, almost at the second generation of the, um, of the church. Do we have um, a time period for that? Yes. Um, the earliest writings that we have in the New Testament date really from, are from Paul. They date from the early 50s uh, through maybe 63 or 64 uh, A.D., the Gospels that we have, most scholars uh, see them as being written, uh, Mark being written first, uh, around 60 AD, uh, somewhere in there. Both Matthew and Luke seem to know the Gospel of Mark, so they're uh, dated um, anywhere from the, after 60 up until 80 or so AD. And most scholars consider the Gospel of John to be written towards the end of the first century, um, so already the three Gospels uh, being in place. 
um, the earliest glimpse that we can see of, of the church reading the Gospels as Gospels doesn't come until, uh, the earliest we can see is around 150 by St. Justin Martyr, who describes a church service where both the Old Testament is read as well as um, what, are, what he calls the memoirs of the Gospels, um, or memoirs of the Apostles, I should say. So um, the development took some time, uh, and um, uh, gradually, though, by the middle of the second century, the canon that we uh, consider the New Testament was at least largely in place. I'm just fascinated that this is a religion that at one point, like many other religions throughout history, might have died out, but it took root in the fabric of the world, basically, and is thriving to this very day. Why do you think that is, Father Eugene? I think that everything started, like Bruce actually hinted to, with the kerygma, with that kind of oral proclamation that God sent his son to be incarnate, then to suffer for us and to be resurrected. And everything was going around the mystery of resurrection. This was a mystery and nobody in the time of Jesus could understand. Why? The Jews, first of all, believed in resurrection. Actually, the resurrection, the bodily resurrection, is a revolutionary idea starting actually in the Old Testament. But the Jews believed that this resurrection will happen at the end of time. The Greeks didn't believe in resurrection. That's why the failure, actually, of the first uh, proclamation of Jesus' resurrection in Athens by Paul in uh, Acts chapter 17 occurred. So to think that these resurrection stories were fabricated is to be out of mind because you didn't serve to anybody. So the Christians truly believed in the resurrection of Christ because it happened in the midst of history. So this is the galvanizing point, if you like, the energy, the seed, actually, of Christianity. And it was transmitted orally, and then because the apostles were dying now after the 60s, like we have uh, uh, Jacob, we have Peter, we have Paul, then the destruction of Jerusalem, the exile of the first church in Pela, not far away from Jerusalem, that were leaving the, the Christians without having the testimonies fixed in writing. But the Christianity didn't appear as a religion of a book appeared as a way of living. That's why the first title is actually in Acts chapter 9, verse 2, is the way, Iodos. And Dr. Beck, and this is a time when people were largely illiterate. So what better way to teach than through an example, I guess? Exactly. I think one of the things to add to Father Eugene's comment is that um, two things were marvelous uh, for people. First of all, the disciples weren't educated. So these men uh, went out and preached, and um, they didn't fear death, and all but one of the apostles was martyred. Um, and their disciples were also willing to die uh, for this message of resurrection. So even if the message didn't make sense initially, the resolve that the early Christians had really made an impression on their neighbors. Now that we have an idea of what is in the Bible and how it came to us, how do we use it? Everybody knows how to quote it to their advantage, which is called proof texting. That is taking little bits from here and there, putting them together and giving an impression of a person's own opinion of how it should be interpreted. How do we quote it for what it really means? Because that is very important. It is conveying to us God's word to all those generations through thousands of years coming down to us to this day to be alive and informative and helpful. How does one go about understanding it when it deals with history from primitive man through to Greek and Roman culture? These are things that it's not like our world today, so it's important to understand the context of when all of these things were written. How do we read it? Obviously, we hear it in church services, such as at the liturgy or at matins or at vespers, but also we are encouraged to read it ourselves. St. Hilary of Poitiers 
says that it's not so much in the reading of the Bible, but in the understanding of it that lies the importance. It's not enough just to read the scriptures. We are in fact told by Christ to search the scriptures. And that is how we inherit the wisdom of God, how we imbibe it, <clears throat> not just through our liturgies and through the church, but through the Bible also. So we need to know how to interpret it properly, what kind of literature it is, because as you've seen from the preceding slides, there is a wide range of sorts and types of literature in it. It's a library of different forms of literature in one book. And how are we supposed to use it? Because a lot of people feel very daunted by this. So how should we read the Bible? Obviously, we hear it in church at the liturgy and at matins and at vespers, but we also should read the scriptures daily. And this is a very useful link to a lectionary, easily accessible at the Greek Archdiocese in America. There are also printed lectionaries, but often your church will have uh, daily lectionaries available for you to use. And the Orthodox Study Bible also has a method of reading the Bible, I think, in a year in its back pages. So that's the first thing we need to do. We have to study them. So we need to read them over and over and over again our whole life long, because there is so much in there that even a whole lifetime will not provide us with all the information that is in the Bible or an understanding of it. It is a lifelong work. The best translations, because there are translations and there are interpretations. Translations that are good use words that are as accurate a translation of the original language in its meaning as possible, whereas interpretations tend to use words that are understandable but don't necessarily convey the exact meaning that was in the original and will often therefore have a bias towards certain various theologies. The Eastern Greek Orthodox New Testament is a good academic translation of the New Testament. The Orthodox Study Bible is also very good as it also has study notes and articles and many other helpful things within its covers. The old Revised Standard Version is a good translation. The new Revised Standard Version is very much um, an interpretation and one should perhaps avoid it. The new King James Version, on the other hand, is a far better translation than the original King James Version, which again is more of a Protestant interpretation than an accurate translation. So we're to read it over and over and over again, but that isn't necessarily going to convey meaning to us. And as I said before, we need to study it. So how do we study it? There are lots of things available to help us expand our knowledge <clears throat> of what we're reading. The Orthodox Bible Study Companion series by Lawrence Farley, I recommend wholeheartedly, and that's available both on Amazon and at Abe Books. Abe Books is a good way of getting um, expensive books at less money because they have good high quality second-hand books available. Ancient Christian Commentary series, that's available on Amazon, but is very, very expensive. Abe Books, it's more um, economical and you can buy the books individually rather than as a set. The Bible and the Holy Fathers for Orthodox is quite a fat volume, but it contains alongside the daily readings for each day, the writings of the fathers expounding on those readings. Also highly recommended. Saint Theophylact, commentaries on various New Testament books is also a good place to go. Father Paul Nadim Tarazzi has written on 
some books in both the Old Testament and the New Testament and is a very good person to go to for further information. An interlinear Bible is invaluable because that will give you the original Hebrew or Greek with the direct English translation underneath it. So that gets you very much closer to the original meaning of the person writing. Concordance is something that lists, we say, by subject, by word. If you want to look up Jesus, it will tell you all the places where the name Jesus occurs in the Bible, and you can then relate them to one another, see in what contexts they're written. A very useful tool for the further study of the Bible. A Bible dictionary will, well, it works as a dictionary, it's what it says on the tin, but it will give you interesting historical background to various things, like the Battle of Jericho, for instance, and it will give you some archaeological facts and things like that that just expand the picture and give you more context. St. John Chrysostom, in his homilies, expounded greatly on scripture and he is one of the fathers one should definitely go to when studying the Bible. And then of course right up to date we have Ancient Faith Radio and on there there are blogs and podcasts and articles on everything Christian that you could possibly wish to know about. Discussions and Bible studies and spiritual sayings everything edifying for the Orthodox Christian. So in summary, we believe that God inspired the Bible and it, it is infallible, but it's neither a science book nor a history book. It is the story first of Israel's relationship with God through the generations up to Christ and the Old Testament foreshadows the new covenant in Christ found in the New Testament. Thereafter, it's a narrative of Christ's life, death and resurrection and the relationship between those surrounding Christ and himself during his time here on earth. This is followed by the earliest years of the church, their relationship with God and how they ordered their lives in the light of Christ's incarnation. And we, of course, as the church continue the story in our present time by partaking in the sacraments and reading the scriptures. So now we come to the end of this session on the Bible. I'm sorry if it was a little drier than the last time, but I hope that you found it interesting and it will start you off on your study of the scriptures and your journey into greater knowledge. On this page, you'll see a bibliography of all the sources I used for this particular talk. And I look forward very much to talking to you again next Thursday at 10.30. See you then. Bye for now. Christ is risen.